Welcome to the Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy, the free podcast for motivated teachers and school leaders who want to inspire their students and school community in literacy learning. Make sure you subscribe to the show on your favourite podcast player, and for more amazing literacy resources, check out the show notes provided with every episode. Hi, I'm Sharon, and I'm the host of a Teacher's Toolkit for Literacy. In every toolkit episode, we bring you specific resources, tools, strategies, tips, techniques to help you in your job as a teacher of literacy. Firstly, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands we gather on. We acknowledge the deep feelings of attachment and relationship of the Ghana people to country, and we respect and value their past, present and ongoing connection to the land and cultural beliefs. Welcome newcomers to the Facebook group and to the podcast. We love hearing all the reasons why teachers across the world are joining. There's so much deep and creative literacy work going on in schools. A couple of recent comments, someone, a pre-service teacher actually, joining for ideas, inspiration and connection with other professionals. And from um, a teacher, not a pre-service teacher, a teacher, a highly experienced teacher, I've been, oh, this year I'm teaching year four. I'm just a classroom teacher who loves to teach. I've been teaching primary school since 1988. I'm an old teacher who's always willing to learn. In my time, I've taught all grades from kindergarten to year six. I've had composites and I've taught multi-age groups. The best of times are when I'm reading to my kids and they beg me not to stop. Literacy is my love and there's nothing better than sharing a good story with children who are inspired to write their own stories because they love books. This year I'm inspired by how eager my students are to respond to feedback and use expert texts to help them write better texts. They love deconstructing a good text and engaging in conversations about the themes and author technique. I'm so excited to be part of the group and to learn from the collective wisdom within. So if you're not a member of the Teachers Toolkit Facebook group, we'd love you to join and introduce yourself to the group. But today, welcome you wholeheartedly to this podcast called New Release Books to Inspire Young Learners. And we have two guests with us today, Lucy Stinson, we welcome you back, Lucy, and Genevieve Crucian, who are here to talk, I'm going to introduce both of them in a moment, but here to talk live from the Where the Wild Things Are bookshop in West End in Brisbane. Um, They've found it hard to select a small number of books to share with you. (laughs) So we're going to hear some um, or have – we're going to hear a lot about um, the the books that sort of made the first cut and then any others that didn't make the cut we'll hear about later. But Lucy – we welcome you back. In um, last time you spoke to us was um, with well, literature was the heart of that too. But in talking about your um, use of literature in the classroom, and this time we have you back talking to you in your new role in the Where the Wild Things Are bookshop. Do you want to tell us just a little bit about that first, Lucy? Oh, thanks, Sharon. Uh, thank you for inviting me to come back. Um, it, well, I guess it's the new, and this is a little bit um, uh, tongue in cheek, but a, a new chapter <laughs> in my <laughs> life. So, um, you know, I've, I've made the, the big call to step away from the classroom after many years and and to have a little bit of a quieter life. And got now quite quite busy because I'm working casually in Where the Wild Things Are bookstore. Um, so I'm surrounded by all the new books that there are coming in uh, each day, each time I work here. And um, just when you think you know lots of books, you discover you don't because there's (laughs) so many wonderful ones and a wonderful staff who just – books are their bread and butter and um, I learn from them all the time as well talking about books. And the connection with the community and children coming in for events and the bookstore going out to schools, um, author visits, it's just a really – buzzing place in terms of um, book loving. So it's um, a good thing for me to be doing at this yes. stage. Yeah. And right beside you is Genevieve Crucian, who is um, the events coordinator at Where the Wild Things Are. And you've been a um, – Genevieve, you've been in a children's bookseller for seven years and 
I know that you absolutely delight in the stories of wild quests and beautiful writing. Um, you love working with authors and illustrators to inspire, um, to create inspiring launches, workshops and events, as well as touring authors around local schools. I'm quite um, envious of some of the authors that you have interviewed in your time, including Neil Schusterman, Kate D. Camillo, John Classen, Emily Gravett, Levi Pinfold. Um, you organise uh, book clubs for teens and children, so Wonder and Wilder Club. Um, you regularly present book chats focusing on new Australian literature to students and teachers and in 2021 won the ABA Penguin Ren Random House Young Bookseller of the Year. So welcome, welcome Genevieve. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so how... How lucky are we? We've got the trio here. Well, I'm doing more of the listening. Um, but the two of you talking to us today um, in a place of absolute passion. Um, and we really thought about why, well, number one, what is it that um, we hope teachers or what's the struggle that teachers um, have when it comes to Really, uh, Lucy, you've sort of touched on it already, but, you know, this, you know, being exposed to literature and, you know, having time and insight into finding out what's available and ready for us um, to be using in classrooms. And teachers are always on the lookout, certainly for fresh ideas, but particularly books that they can use in the classroom – and I love that today that you're going to talk a bit about some of the latest releases because teachers always like to be one step ahead of children, being able to bring children books that they haven't necessarily come across before. So um, I know you're also, Lucy, going to bring us some ways to connect these texts with the curriculum. And as teachers, we're always thinking, you know, what books we can use for our read-alouds or for mentor texts or for shared reading or to stimulate writing, or for looking at word work. And so today we're going, to, we're going to get you to talk a little bit about each of the books and the author, um, how we might use them, where we might start using them and how we can use them well, how we might plan with them against the Australian curriculum, and maybe what are some um, connections that we can make to those through tools and resources. So that's my zip and, you know, for those people that like to get straight into the meat of things, they can have skipped all of that bit <laughs> and let's get into talking about books. So where would you like to start? Um, Sharon, what I thought I might begin with is looking uh, ahead because uh, 24 is when we're looking at the implementation of the new version of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So um, to get our heads ready for that, which is really only a short time, really. Um, I looked at what was what was new in that um, area, and one of the things that's quite it's not brand new, as in it's always been a, a, a feature to talk to use books written by First Nation authors, mm. but it, that was a little bit um, ad hoc, you might say, and talked about more in some year levels than others. Whereas now it's quite explicitly stated in every year level uh, in the primary years for uh, there to be literature by First Nations Australian authors yeah. as well as obviously wide-ranging Australian authors and authors from around the world. But yeah. it's a given that there will be books that will need to be um, shared and used and um, explored by First Nations authors. So that's why it was very hard to pick because one of the trends in um, new books, which is reflective of our society mm. and very reflective of this community here too, which is interesting, um, is that we have um, a deluge of great books that are, that are being um, produced and published um, on First Nations. And we can be quite discerning with those because often they have been um, prepared by First Nations people, you know, right from mm. the outset of publishing. So um, we, we know that we're getting um, the right uh, information. So one that I, just to be selective, I just picked out one picture book and just looking at that early years level, um, there's 
books going right through different year levels um, that we might get to mention. But this one is just one that one of the other um, people, our manager in the store, brought to me this today called, and I don't know how to pronounce it, I'll do my best, Nini Marel. That's my go to Mother Earth by Melissa Greenwood. And it's a really beautiful book. I mean, you know, you know immediately that it is a First Nations book because of the Indigenous art work. And, and and Melissa Greenwood is she and her daughter have a homewares company that completely matches the aesthetic of the book. It's these beautiful kind of pastel pinks um, that are used throughout that are beautiful. Mm. And it's all of the very you know, the dots and the patterns and everything that you would expect to see. Yes. Um, and they give a background to their own the author's own background and their own language background. Um, so, of course, that's really important to the context of the story, that it comes from the heart of the Indigenous people. Um, and it's really a story of where it's sharing um, the connection to Earth, but also the connection to family. So it's got Nini Marel. She created us, you and me. She birthed in Nima. She's the giver of life and created all that we see. My precious baby, will you listen to me? I want you to know that you were once a seed in me. You're now in my arms, as precious as can be. So I won't read the whole text, but it's got that lovely rhythmic sense to it. Um, You know, obviously it's one of those books that you would begin with a read aloud um, and children just to feel the book. Mm. Um, But it's also, and so, you know, if you're looking at the content of curriculum, you know, at that prep level where you're really just going to be sharing those stories, but it's a text that you can take to many layers and, you know, you can talk about the connection in year one about how the images are used to tell that story as well, but in this um, Indigenous way. So it's a book that you can comfortably use with preps, but you can continue through in the other year levels to look at more deeply um, and even just... The way the colours work, as um, Genevieve mentioned, are, are just really soothing. They're not the bold, bright colours you might expect. They're, they're different from that, um, but they're still very authentic to, to it. So that's that's the first book, which is called Mini Marel, Mother Earth by Melissa Greenwood. I think there's something really special as well, knowing that you're uh, reading a book that's all about a mother's connection to their child and at the same time knowing that that mother and daughter, like, uh, have a business together. I mm. I really appreciate that. Oh uh, yeah, I didn't know that background. So, mm. yeah. so that, that that's the first book. Okay, and just to um, I'll just say now too that all the books that you mention um, we'll make sure they're all listed in the show notes so that you've got those um, uh, so people can follow up on those. So yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll send you the details of of them. That, yeah. So you've got where to go. Beautiful. Um, so that's just one. I could have had many on mm. that. On that, uh, this one I'm looking at again. We're looking at the cross curricular um, um, priorities that so, you know the, we can address in the current curriculum because they're there. But in the new version, they're really clearly uh, aligned and linked all the time, which I found it really easy to navigate in the new curriculum, which is great. Um, and the one that's probably not as strong in, in the content in the curriculum for the early years, but I think you can begin it um, in this way. There's a book here called Be Careful, and I'm going to do my best to pronounce it, Zhao Jin, and it's, it's a new book by Alice Kang and Shi Real Ming. So it's an Asian um, little Chinese boy. And what's beautiful in this book, um, Be Careful, Zhao Jin, is it has underneath the text on each page, it also has, now I don't know what the correct terminology is, but it's got the writing in Asian symbols. Right. So every word is also written in Asian symbols. And it's a little boy who feels like his family are always telling him to be careful and he wanders away. Um, and in that story, it's really about learning to conquer your own fears and as, and as a child, as an adult, because he goes and then everyone is looking for him. Everyone does worry about him. Um, and he thinks they don't know what I can do, but then he's found and glad to be found. So it's it's a really soft, lovely book. Um, it's not particularly Asian is as in the cultural parts of it, other than, you know, you recognise the, the um, racial 
group of the family and their language that's written down. Yeah. But I think it just is broadening children's sense of diversity that, and the, and for, for Asian children, obviously, for them to go, I can see me in that story. Mm. And, and that dual language, you know, those bilingual books, I think, are a really um, important um, text type that have come into the mix. Um, and I've noticed that even with some of the um, First Nations books that often the language and so keeping the language alive of um, those different nations by putting that into picture books, you know, is really allowing students to, like you say, not only see themselves culturally but to see themselves because their language is there. So, and it's really exciting, I think, um, for us as well to get to learn like any of those yeah. first, first nation words, yes, um, especially when they're in, like integrated within the text like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I agree. That's you know that's where we, the learning is so much richer because it's being brought to us, especially in those first nations books. And I think that was a really important point to draw out from the curriculum, Lucy, that. Um, you know that we're not just learning about First Nations. We are we are learning about them because they are telling us <laughs> that you know yeah. we're getting their their stories. So yeah, beautiful. This, one, this second book that I just mentioned, which is more to do with that, the, you know, our Asian um, cross curriculum priority. Yes, it's just I think embedding the beginning of that that mm. understanding and appreciation of people who aren't very far away from our shores mm. in many respects, but also who um, we have a lot of connections with um, in many ways in the world, but rather than leaving it to the older year levels where they really get into that um, cross-curricular priority, start it in the early years with just that awareness. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Alice Pung is a great author to check out in general. She has books, uh, children's books for a whole range of ages right up to young adult as uh, well. Right, that's yeah. always good to know, isn't it? Uh, you know, when there's um, when authors write across a range of age levels, it's nice to... It's yeah. nice to have that experience through their writing. Mm. And this one too, I mean, this, this is the hard part about a podcast. You, you can't see yeah. how beautiful the images are because in this book, this little boy, like a toddler-type child, is standing on the edge of the lake and in the reflection in the in the lake is who he thinks he is, which is a red fire warrior mm. in, in a dress. That's the mirror image he has of himself, yeah. which, you know, John Callow's work on visual grammar, you think, well, there's a whole lot of storytelling just in that. You don't mm. have to even, you can tell from the cover that this boy is thinking, that's who I am, I'm this warrior. Yeah. And it's also perfect as well because, like, the, the title is in English with the boy there and then it's um, in, oh, yeah. then it's ref the reflection is in the bilingual oh, language. So the right. the reflection is carried beautifully. Yeah, it's, it's oh. actually, there's a heap in terms of, um, which is another thing in the curriculum that I think is still a really strong thread in the new curriculum. Um, the, the visual grammar in this book is huge because you know, there's pages where it's just his face and the rest of the page is just about black. So, you know, of course, yeah. there's a salience of him is really crystal clear. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a great book for many reasons, um, particularly because – and it's it just makes you feel good too. Mm, yes. Another, another book that's more to do with rather, um, sort of the – the capability to do with understanding diversity in the world. This is, I think she, um, uh, Genevieve will correct me, she's a Brisbane author. Yeah, so, uh, it's Amasari by Sandhya Parapukaran and illustrated by Michelle Paraira. Uh, I think it's Paraira. And it's beautiful. This is the second book they've done together and it's by this wonderful imprint that if you aren't aware of it, it's an imprint of Hardy Grant. It's called Bright Light and they have a focus on uh, discussing books on on representing own voices um, and with a focus on diversity. So they're a wonderful imprint to check out all their books. And they're also printed with amazing quality. That is beautiful, beautifully designed and created books. Um, and Amasari is a beautiful story about a, a young girl who she doesn't understand why her, her ama, her mother always wears her sari everywhere and she's a bit self-conscious about the attention it draws from other people and how people always stare at her ama wherever they go. And then there's just a simple moment in the shopping centre where um, she can't find her ama and she gets lost and overwhelmed and then she's able to find her through the sari, through seeing her sari. The beautiful thing I love about this story is when Sandhya 
launched it, she told us about how her ama, um, living in Australia, would always wear her sari. And the fact that her her mum wasn't a, a brave woman, she wasn't a woman who, oh, not not wasn't a brave woman. She wasn't a woman who liked to be looked at. Mm-hmm. And so the simple bravery that came for her to wear her sari every day and and how much respect she had for her mother from that was just a really beautiful connection for me. Um, I really love Sundia's writing. Uh, She writes with really lovely metaphors. This is the same author who wrote um, The Boy Who... The Boy Who Tried to Shrink His Name. Uh Uh-huh, yes. Which is that gorgeous story of Zimdalamashka Mishkada who isn't quite sure about his name. Yeah. Um, and sharing it with kids, other kids. Yeah. So people might know that book because I think it was shortlisted. shortlisted. Yes, this yeah. in twenty twenty two. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And this, this one's and this one's the next book, which has just been released. Mm. And I, I became aware of this book because on my very first day working at uh, where the wild things are, some three year old children came in from a local little kindergarten, which is in Queensland, three four year olds. Yeah. Um, so before they've started school at kindergarten and um, they they came in to listen to stories that Genevieve read to them and this was one of the books that she shared. So, um, and, you know, in my mind, one of the things that came to my mind is, uh, you know, my connection with the arts. I thought, oh, you could just have a fabric like that and because it's, it's almost this sheer pink fabric and you could do a whole lot of drama around that sheer pink fabric that you could use as you were exploring this text so. oh you could and just as an example of some of the language this thing simple as ama pleats her sari the folds flare out like a waterfall just really strong imagery that's beautiful yeah so that's a lovely book that one okay now this one might touch your heart sharon because this is where i thought you know it's something that gets a little bit um neglected not I don't think deliberately, but it's just, you know, in a busy teaching world. Um, so it's a it's a poetry book. And I chose it also because it explores the notion of diversity because it's books that are, it, the title is, and everything will be glad to see you, and it's poems by women and girls. Mm. And they've got a quite a big blurb about wanting to have the voice of women and girls through poetry. Um, so it's it's an interesting book just from that perspective, and also because it's a you know, it's a good collection of poetry that you would be able to pick and choose what would be useful to explore it. And from you know you might want to look at it through the the fact that the voice of women, or you might just want to take it for the structure of poetry and how it works. So um, that's that's a new book. I don't know if you've heard of that one. No, I haven't. And so is, so that's a collection. Um, is it illustrated or? Yes. It's, yes. it's illustrated mm. and it's got, yeah, it's got really, really lovely um, sort of probably acrylic paint type illustrations. Quite bright. Mm. Yeah, very mm. bright. Um, yeah, sort of naive style artwork. Mm-hmm. Um, um, it also seems to be quite um, diverse racially. Oh, it's got a little ribbon so you can keep oh, your place. <laughs> I'm loving it all the more. <laughs> um, and you know, it's got it's got simple poems and complex poems. There's one here that's called "You Gather Back the Kid," and it, the way the text is laid out, you'd have to see it to appreciate it. But it's very spread each line. It goes, "Evening, you gather back all that dazzling dawn has put asunder. You gather a lamb, gather a kid, gather a child to its mother." And it's it's for, it's by a translation of a, of a Sappho poem, so we're getting nice like ancient poems as well as modern poems. Yep. Oh, so. This is, do you know, even yeah. though we can't see the books at the moment, the the richness of what you're sharing with us over the airwaves is, you know, I can picture, I can, but just hearing hearing these snippets of things, hearing um, the stories and what you know about these books, you know, the the information behind them. Is really so rich for us, you know, to not just see a book on the shelf, but to know, oh, some of the treasure that's, you know, right there within that. So, yep. Yep. And there's, if you go to the content curriculum, you know, there, there's something every year that you, to, to deepen um, poetry through from prep, exploring it through to, you know, the, the children later on being able to look at all the, the features of the, the, the technical features and the metaphors and things mm. in the, 
Okay. So that it's called it's selected by a woman called Ella Rizbridger. So mm-hmm. I'll send you the, all the details, but that that's it's quite a, a big book. It's like it's not a it's not a small book. I I thought whilst we're on poetry, I could just as a very quick sideline mention one of my favorite uh verse novels that came out within the last year or so. Mm-hmm. It's what it's called What Snail Knows by Catherine Apple. She's written a fair few verse novels and it is a wonderful it's it's just a wonderful story to check out, just as a quick sideline. Okay. I know. We're just having a little <laughs> chuckle here, just loving, just keep talking. You know, I'm just going to, I, I really just need to zip my lips and you girls just keep going for it. <laughs> um, if you insist. Yes. Um, that's Sharon, you'll know, you know, how many times you've had um, discussions and podcasts around the notion of um, word inquiry. Mm-hmm. So this isn't probably a book you sit up and you read from cover to cover at all. It's more of a resource book for um, teachers and students and it's by someone called Tom Reed Wilson. Convenient middle name. Yeah, yes, convenient middle name. <laughs> and it's called Every... And on the front cover it's very uh, appealing and engaging for children because there's a, sort of a character that looks very much like a, a Shrek character and a robot and, you know, all sorts of uh, fantasy sort of things there. So, and very Quentin Blake-esque. Yeah, oh. it is, yeah. Yes. Full of colour. Yeah. It's illustrated by someone called Ian Morris. And it's called Every Word Tells a Story. And it's an extraordinary A to Z of etymological exploration. So you know what how this is close to my heart with word inquiry work. <laughs> so I recently shared this at a, at a, um, a book chat I did at a, a school. And it was really fun. I just read out one of the – it goes through telling you a lot of different words and it uses rhyme a lot of the time to explain them. And instantly, like instantly the kids were engaged and the kids chose it for their library. Yes. Yeah. Now, yeah. I'm just going to go to – I just flicked to this and found I – oh, I wish I'd had this book back when I taught year four a couple of years ago because the word Friday is here. And I did a word exploration where you know, we were using Lynn English's um, – Lynn, Lynn, Lynn Anderson's um, uh, sort of scientific inquiry approach at that stage. Yes. So we would, we, we would get a word that came from a text and maybe, I can't remember what text we had, but the word we focused on after they all volunteered a word was friend. And we were doing this in lockdown, right. <laughs> I think this by, by memory. And with the word friend, we looked at... Um, the prefixes and suffixes we could add to the base word, and of course it was. Um, and what we looked at was the fact that Friday is a cousin of the word friend and what links it back. And they're, so they're not in the same word family, but they're a cousin because they both go back to this um, this um, god called Frigga who was a goddess of love. So you can see the goddess of love turned into the word friend so you go down that path, mm-hmm. that family tree, or you go down another path, another part of the family tree, and you end up with the word Friday. Um, so, and that was one of our. I remember the kids loving this word because you know her name, the goddess of love, was Frigga, F R I W G A. So here it is as a page. It's got the word Friday. It's got this big image of the goddess of love. And a little bit about that background, which is more historical, um, more etymology than it is about base words and um, mm-hmm. suffixes and prefixes. But it's still, you know, it's just you could you could use this and go, well, I'm going to pick out that word from a text that I'm using, a literature, or I'm just going to explore that word for its own sake. Mm-hmm. But it has some really weird and wonderful words. I loved, I read hippopotamus to the kids I chatted with. And so apparently potamus means river and hippo is a horse. And it's just a great breakdown of a word. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they're written about the hippopotamus in a verse. The, the whole information is embedded in a verse. So it's a really um, imaginative way mm. to treat etymology. And I think the ki- if you had this in your classroom, you would really inspire kids to love word inquiry. So, um, and that's that's a new book out. Uh, very recently, uh, uh, within the last month. Yeah, Every oh. Word Tells a Story. Every okay. Word Tells a Story, right. Now, this is a really quick one. It's I haven't done any quick connections. I just read it and thought, oh, my God, this book is so much fun. <laughs> and and it was, I could just hear children giggling with it. And I guess we, it, there's a lot of thinking about critical um creative and critical thinking in it because it's called Elephant Island and basically it's an elephant who ends up stranded on this minute island, like his feet fit on it and that's it. That's a whole island. 
and then <laughs> and then then all these um, things go on where different boats come up to rescue him, and they all try to balance on this one tiny island, and it's full of the most creative images and ways to construct things together. Um, so it, it says shipwrecked Arlen, Arlen Arnold, the elephant, washes up on a tiny island. After a long time, a mouse comes to the rescue, but Arnold is too big because he steps in the mouse's boat and he just smashes it to pieces. <laughs> so then they're both on the rock. And then they use the mouse boat wreckage to expand the island and Elephant Island gets bigger and bigger because it's all wreckage that it gets bigger with and too much fun to leave the home. And it's just a book the kids will giggle at it and you could do lots of creativity about how you could construct something like that. So it's, it's a lovely book. Now I'm going to hand over to Genevieve for a, a really expert advice on some graphic novels because they're another big trend with um, literature for children that is a real hook for them to read. And that, that was something that's come through from children experiencing you know, COVID lockdowns that to get some children re-engaged, um, that was a discussion I had with someone today at the bookstore that they found graphic novels has been a, a really good hook to get children to, to re-engage with books if they have not stayed engaged. Yeah, I think graphic I will I think the thing with graphic novels is right there that a lot of the time their pacing and their panelling is that's that midpoint between movies and books in that like you're getting the frames that are similar to similar to how you'd frame things in a movie. And so it just makes them that much more accessible. And of course kids are just trained in visual literacy from so much of a younger age that I think that just makes them accessible. Uh, we've our graphic novel section has definitely grown over the last five years and become a real feature in the store, and we always want to grow it. Um, Remy Lai, I think a lot of people would be familiar from with because of her marvelous book Picasso, that has just been infinitely popular, and she's actually won the Prime Minister's Award. For, I can't remember which of her books, but she, she's well accoladed and also really popular popular in the U.S. as well. And her latest series is her series that's most accessible to younger readers, although it has a really broad readership. Uh, one of my co-workers' sons is 10, and he adores it, Whereas, and I think it is accessible to seven-year-olds as well. It is. Um, all the text is in all caps, which, of course, makes it a little bit harder if you're trying to give it to someone um, who is struggling a little bit with reading uh, or has dyslexia. But uh, basically, this her new series, The Surviving the Wild, has three books out in it. There's Rainbow the Koala, Star the Elephant, and the newest, Sunny the Shark. And there's just these little stories. They're all based on real stories about different animals uh, going through a problem, an environmental problem, and coming out on the good side of it. And interestingly, I, I just find creation-wise, this is the first series she's coloured herself. When she did her graphic novel, Picasso, someone else has coloured that. Um, so that's just an interesting, I think, uh, if you're wanting to know about the process of books, you can look. She also has hybrid novels, um, Pie in the Sky and Fly on the Wall, which both, uh, particularly Pie in the Sky, looks at the experience of being a kid moving to Australia. It's a... a, a a Chinese boy who moves to Australia and how he feels alienated here. So she's a marvellous author and they're really great. It's a, a great new series. I also want to mention when we're talking about this, these particular books here, there's a really strong um, uh, thread of knowledge about sustainability in there, which is one of those cross-curricular priorities that we want to bring out in the teaching. So, and it's, you know, the, these books do that work for you because they've got that topic. So... Sharon, I just want to check that you can still hear us. Yes, I can. I'm just trying not to interrupt. <laughs> we're talking. I thought, what if we're talking to thin air here? <laughs> oh, no, I <laughs> love that. You're a great listener. <laughs> no, well, I did say I was going to zip my lips and just let you talk. And then I, I thought, I better come good on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, again, I'm, I'm passing over to Genevieve, and I, if I see curriculum things to mention, I will, but... Um, Genevieve is the guru of knowing a book when a child comes in, um, and particularly in the middle primary, upper primary, young adult, and, and want to move on with, you know, a book that they love, they would love to read. And um, so I'm really in awe of how she knows these books. So I'm going to hand over to her for some other 
uh, bigger, heavier books. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, well, a series I am a big fan of. So I read it with my Wonder Club, which is for 10 to 13-year-olds. Uh, it's by B.B. Elston. Um, he's he's a you know, uh, U.S. author. And his newest book, the series is called Amari. And So the first one's Amari and the Knight Brothers. And the one that's just come out within the last month is Amari and the Great Game. So this, this is, I would say, a, I think it would be a really great read aloud in the classroom. It's great writing. It's quite pacey. It's a fantasy adventure, and the protagonist is a person of color. So you, I don't – there just aren't that many fantasies that are, as of yet, that we have access to. So, um, but, so basically, Amari's brother has gone missing. Um, he went missing about six months ago, and he was the – best basically he was the best in the neighborhood he was really clever everyone looks up to him and it turns out that he was a member of the bureau of i have to check the name the bureau of supernatural affairs and he was one of their top agents and of course it turns out that in this world that we live in there are actually ogres and witches amari is when she finds out this information given a little like eye drop that she puts in her eyes and she instantly discovers that her 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 neighbor is an ogress and there's a witch been sitting next to her on the bus all the time and amari wants to save her brother so she joins this bureau it has a little bit of context of what it's like for her growing up african-american and what it's like in her neighborhood and how things are different for her and it's just great having that within the within the sitting of a fantasy book and it is a book that was unanimously loved in book club, which is unheard of. Um, <laughs> they're very critical. Um, Jennifer, so I think- oh, sorry. Um, here uh-huh. I am interrupting. Just um, finish talking about the book, but then just um, just tell me a little or just tell us a little bit about um, how you run book club. Sure. So we mm. we just uh, meet twice a term mm. and we all read the same book and then come together and chat about it. Uh, both, I, I try and theme afternoon tea about it if I can, mm. which did involve when we did uh, Glass House of Stars by Shirley Ma, the oh, CBCA yes. winner of this year. Yes. When we when we did that, did include the kids just eating sayo biscuits because the mum eats sayo biscuits a lot in it. Mm. Um, but it's a and, and we do a rating at the end of the book club, which is just a rating out of ten, and it's just a lovely group of kids that is really comfortable talking about books and it's wonderful seeing i can definitely see throughout the year um the the book like their ability to discuss books critically improving and i always think like if it if an author actually wanted to hear how to make their book work, they should just come to a book club because (laughs) they tear them apart really effectively (laughs) Um, so they meet twice a term and do they come um, – so does that mean you do a number of books over the year and they, yeah, so they come the whole year? Yeah. Well, they don't have to. They can just no. book for a session or just for the right. term. Right. But most of, uh, most of the kids I have for the whole year. Mm. Um, How wonderful. And I have, so I have a, a, a girl in my – in Wilder Club, my teen book club, who has been coming to book club for like five years. Mm. Uh, so she's, she's worked her way through the ranks of all the book clubs. How fabulous. So you run those for um, the got, teens? Well, the, the bookstore has – we have three. We have one for 7 to 10, 10 to 13, and 13 plus. Mm-hmm. And um, our 7 to 10 and 10 to 13 are really popular. We've got multiple groups for them. Um, and then our 13 plus is more of an intimate, like, eight teenagers that, that come. Um, but, again, with them, it's really beautiful. They're, I've seen – they're kids that have gone to the same school but weren't friends before book club and have now formed friendships through book club. Um, and it's just – it's really wonderful seeing them come out of their shell. And, and some of them are definitely self-professed, not particularly social creatures that have found a safe and comfortable place in book club. Mm. So for those children in the – I mean, I guess you've got them coming from across neighbourhoods in Brisbane. yeah. And so you run those after school hours, obviously, or are they on weekends? No, yeah, Friday afternoons. Friday afternoons. Oh, all right. So I could join the 13 plus. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, 
because there isn't a teacher group, I take it. Oh, well, look, we probably would. Mm. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not quite in the neighbourhood, but by golly, I'd join the book club, isn't it? Yeah, you know, that's the... Um, this was a buzzing place in the, in the school holidays um, where there was um, many, many events. Um, it was hard to keep up with what was going on because mm. there was art, art workshops with illustrators. There was you know, oh, Harry Potter sleepover. Um, there was uh, all sorts of um, events and children in their own time, in their holidays, I don't think they came under duress, no. um, sitting in the sitting in the bookstore uh, and on a concrete floor mm. reading a book and you could hear a pin drop. I went, mm. well, these are, these are true book lovers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, anyway, I'll let Genevieve continue yes. because there's a book that is just delightful that she's going to um, connect to. Well, I, I thought I'd mention Rabbit Soldier, Angel Thief, Katrina Nanestad's uh, second wartime story. So uh, it came out at the end of last year, and you'd all know it from uh, its, I guess, the partner to We Are Wolves, which she also wrote. And she's she's also written things like The Girl, uh, oh, what is it? I always forget it. The Girl, The Writer, and the, oh no, something rather in Rome. Um, and she's got really playful writing, really clever writing, wonderful Australian author. But, and it, this one, so Werewolves is uh, about the the wild children in Germany who, as the, when the Second World War is lost, they become orphaned and they have to survive in the forest. And it's based on true children. And so Rabbit Soldier, Angel Thief, this newer book, is about a Russian boy soldier. So I think what's wonderful about both her books here is that she provides you with the idea that um, there is a different voice, there is a different idea, there are individuals, kind of that, like, there is no good or evil, there are just people in war. And so it's perfect for any of those kids that are interested in wartime stories. And I think at the moment being able to have a have a book that has a, a little Russian child um, and what his experience is, is really important and a really great way to have a conversation. Mm. Um, it's, it is heartbreaking. I sobbed a fair bit. <laughs> um, yes. I will definitely the, admit that I sobbed a lot. <laughs> yeah, you did as well. I was mm. driving around listening to the audiobook and I was just like, sobbing 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 mm. the whole time <laughs> yeah no and it is beautifully written or oh, she's a great author i also it was kind of funny though my book club kids some of them loved it it was like top notch for them then at the end of it some of the other kids were like can we have a less depressing book next time <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> and you'd have one of those too <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah did you prefer We Are Wolves or Rapid Soldier Angel Thief? I, th I think I, I think We Are Wolves is still my, is the one. Yeah, I think because it was well, it was the first one of hers that I read that I think that one spoke to me the most because it was this fresh voice mm. on something that, you know, I'd been intrigued in about these, you know, the. Mm these children in the forest. Um, and so I suppose maybe coming into the second one, it was similar kind of writing, different topic, but that first one, We we Are Wolves, just opened a whole new world for me, I think, because of, you know, her writing style and the topic that she'd chosen. So Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I, I also think, um, I guess one of the reasons I was interested to discuss Rabbit Soldier, Angel Thief with Book Club was because it is quite sentimental. And so I was curious how kids would respond to that. Um, but it didn't it didn't deter them, certainly. No, no, no. And I, I absolutely agree with you, though, that the reason, you know, wanting to read that book, and in fact, um, I came to um, Rabbit Soldier... Angel Thief. Angel Thief. I'm having a blank. Um, you know, someone had gifted it to me saying... Like I've just finished it, the pages have dried and, you know, <laughs> I'd like you to read it. Um, and it was just so topical, like a Russian child mm -hmm. here, like to see like everybody's perspective is 
critical. Yeah. And every story is one to listen to. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's Sharon, if we're looking, I don't know the book, but if you're looking at the, our English curriculum, that that deep thinking about perspective and voice, you know, that that's only going to come through by having quality literature. You're not going to get that with um, with books that don't address those sort of um, big issues. No, you're absolutely right, Lucy. That's a great connection to make there, that, yeah, perspectives. And that's a word that does, um, I think it appears... Um, it appears in this version of the curriculum. I'm not, I think. I haven't, I haven't checked it, but I can't imagine it. Well. Yeah, I'm pretty it's sure just, it's um, there this time. It surprises, but, yeah. <laughs> but, but at the same time, perspective is right there from, um, you know, the view, in the, I'm sure year four we were looking at view the way yes. different authors present their viewpoints. Yeah. So it would have yeah. to be still. Yes. Uh, we're getting to the wards end, but. There's some lovely linked books that um, Genevieve's going to share. They're ones that um, are not new, but there's a brand new one that's a sequel from them. So that's why she's going to talk about the series of books. Oh, um, well, I was going to – so Tristan Banks, who I imagine um, many people would be familiar with, he has a new book called Pop and Robber. And like his other books, um, it is great because it's giving you kind of – a perspective of someone you probably haven't read before. It's about, and this one's, it's a great, it's a great book because it has his uh, classic action writing. So his his other books is Detention, which is an amazing story um, about a refugee es- um, es- escaping from a detention center in Australia and a boy who finds her and has to just dis- dis- realizes that maybe what the law says isn't right or wrong and has to decide for himself what right or wrong is. And then his other action books, The Fall and Two Wolves. So Cop and Robber is about a boy whose mum is a cop and his dad is like an old, he was an athlete, he's not anymore, he doesn't really know exactly what he is, but he can kind of bumble around and steal things, <laughs> except sometimes that does include things like stealing, like, so he, he steals from a fuel station and bumbles around gets everything gets the money and then runs into the door because it's a push not a pull and the and the <laughs> attendants they're like it's gesturing for him showing pull pull the door and so it's about this boy who um his parents are separated and basically he has to uh he's there's a he's in between them a little bit in this in this current his mum is trying to find out this local robbery and knows knows pretty solidly that it was probably him. And so the great thing about Tristan is his books have higher content, but they're really readable. So like, I think they're really great for a grade sixer to read, but they're short chap, like content wise, the stories suit older readers, but they're short chapters, sometimes like two or three pages, larger text, the vocab still great. Um, but they're just, yeah, really readable, flow really well, really pacey. Um, and he's just, a, I think, a pretty marvellous author in general. And he's a great speaker. Have you interviewed him? Uh, we've had launches of his here, yes. yes. Yeah. Well, now, I have to tell you, do you know who is coming? And, he, and I'm very excited about it. And I'm, I'm going to come in even though I'm not working that day. Is Alison Lester is oh. coming. <laughs> There's so an institution. Oh, my goodness. There's not an Alison Lester book that I don't I love. Know. <laughs> I know. So I, I'm just going to try and make my weekend around that because it's mm. on a Sunday. Mm. And these these people at this store work any day of the week. There's no rules on what days they work. <laughs> um, and on Thursday night, I'm going to Richard Feidler's um, launch of his book. From, oh. From, with things are too. So there's never-ending... Mm. Um, things that have happened here with the bookstore. Now, I don't know if you need us to finish, but there was two books that I just thought, they're not brand new, but I think going back to putting the First Nations at the heart of our, um, you know, our direction and curriculum, because it is a pretty big deal in terms of that, 
I think maybe a shift but focus in the in the curriculum to make sure that happens mm. and also it's a big shift in terms of what's coming out in and book releases there's such a big increase in um, First Nations yeah so, it's, it's in the last I'd say even year and a half we're going down to I'd say there's a First Nation release uh, there's a multiple First Nations releases a month um, which is just is a really big increase mm. yeah now this book, if you know this book, because it's got many um, awards, mm-hmm. um, it's and it, what I like about it is that again, it's a verse book, so that we we're going to be able to incorporate poetry as a more constant thing in in school. The Bindi, the book Bindi by Curly Saunders. Do you know that book? I've not read it. Talk it's, to it's us like, about it. It's through it's through the voice of an eleven year old girl, really about her everyday sort of life, and then it leads into the fact that there's a there's a bushfire. Um, I haven't read it thoroughly. I've, I've done a browse of it. It's got the most interesting layout, you know, in terms of verse. It does the the verse that sort of is navigating around the page to uh, to make you read it in a different way from reading as you normally would. It's got everyday events like going to hockey and things, but then it's got beautiful things about what what happens to the earth with the, the bushfire. Um, so it's it's a lovely verse book and it, it's won a number of awards. Yeah, and Curly Saunders is a wonderful young poet, and I recently judged the Queensland Literary Awards with her. We she, uh, we were judging the Children's Prize, and the next book that um, Lucy's picked out for us was one of the ones we shortlisted on the QLAs, um, the First Scientists. And oh, yes, that um, one I do know. Yes. 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 And apparently Corey came in, one of the girls I was talking to today um, that works here as well, she was saying how she's had Corey in here to discuss this book. So, um, And it's illustrated by um, Archibald Portrait Prize winner Black Douglas. Yes. Yeah. So it, and that's a very good book from getting that perspective of um, – Science through the Indigenous perspective, um, a little bit like the the new version of Dark Emus. That's the, yeah, it just yes. goes through yeah, telling you so many interesting, cool things and creations made by first scientists. And mm. I also, on that note, I did want to mention um, amazing book uh, Kuni, which uh, K U N Y, uh, which is written by Kuni, and it won the Queensland Literary Awards Children's Book. And it's a story. It's full of her paintings and it's the story of her life as a member of the stolen generation um living in the mission and it's it's simple frank language it would be amazing in the classroom because you can also just like dip in on any page you don't need to read it chronologically it just tells you about certain times about why how she got taken about what it was like for her mother and um in its simplicity it's very emotional um, but very, yeah, very factual as well. So it's, I think, an amazing resource um, to have. So, um, so I, that we've got. I, there's more books I have here, but at the <laughs> yeah. same time, I, I've got. Uh, I've, I've, we've gone through the ones we sort of put on top of our list. Yeah, um, you can keep going. We can keep going. Yes, yes. Oh, let me give you, tell you then another one that almost made that shortlist that I really love, which is called Herald, uh, Heroes, Rebels and Innovators by Karen oh, Wilde. Yes, one of my, you know oh, look, I've used this book a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yes, talk to us about it. <laughs> oh, I just, I love the language and it's so beautiful. Mm. So, um, it tells you about, I think, seven different First Nation people and just their stories and they're like identifiable throughout history. I love, so the very first one is Pat, uh, Patia Garang, who I knew about from reading one of Kate Grenville's books. But mm. so she um, was friends with William Dawes and taught him her language. He taught her about, um, about his, his interests and his research. And it's just a yeah a two page story. Um, I love that it, it pairs. So it has the narrative, which is written, I think, just beautifully. Mm. It's a, a lovely read aloud, and then it has just the simple facts written on another page. So you've got that um, narrative and that nonfiction elements, and the illustrations are gorgeous. The yeah, it. it's a real trifecta for each of the um, each of the people being represented, isn't it? You know that. So it's really like the narrative is really a verse narrative isn't it it almost is you're right yeah yeah um 
Yes, and then uh, the story, yeah, yeah. yeah, and then the facts beyond that, but the, the illustration. Who is the illustrator of that one? It is Jalen uh, by Bayou My Wife. Yeah, yeah, I love the artwork. Mm. And, and one thing, whenever I um, read any of those aloud, which is often to groups of adults, um, people are always fascinated whenever there is a memorial to any of those people to mm. think that there's a memorial that we may have actually driven past or walked past that we've never been aware of before. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah so. And also there are teacher uh, things that is always worth checking out, but Hachette, the publisher, has teacher notes for it available on their website. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, yeah, good to mention those because it is nice to um, – because that's – in the absence of having, you know, wonderful people like you talking about those books, the teacher notes can also give us some insights into, which is always interesting, insights into the author or the illustrator or connections that we can make with those books. Mm. Yeah. Uh, while we're talking a little bit about this, there's a book, I think I shared this with you in a photograph last week. Um, it's a new book called Blow. It's just poetry for little children, but mm. it's, you know, it, it doesn't, I don't think you'd have to just keep it for the very tiny children. It's called Blow a Kiss, Catch a Kiss, mm-hmm. and it's poems to share with little ones. And it's written by or collected by Joseph uh, Col- Colho. Oh, he's a, he does wonderful work. Yeah, so mm. I think he's an award-winning person. And then I just picked out the, the one, the poem in here that re- that relates to the title, and the poem's called Blow a Kiss. because Blow a Kiss, Catch a Kiss, When We Are Apart. Blow a kiss, catch a kiss, put it in your heart. And, and so that's a poem that you could do so much with that with young Aww. children mm-hmm. and, and they would know it. You could have it as a greeting to say goodbye each day. It would, you know, it's – it's it's um, and so it's one way of, of integrating poetry. I'm sure you could dip in and read a poem every day out of this book yeah. um, and, and make poetry a daily ritual. Mm. Um, and then this is the other one, Sharon, that you put me on too, which I went and found off on the shelves. Yes. It's Australian Backyard Buddies. Oh, so it's, yeah. yeah, it's not exactly. So, oh, the, the sequel to um, Backyard Birdies by yeah. Andy Gabbett. And he's yes. from Brisbane. And, you know, and I, I, you remember last year, uh, not yet, was it last year? Yes, that seems so long ago now. <laughs> uh, when I was doing the work with um, – Informative text and the children finding, you know, hunting for text features. Yes. And this one's got some really interesting sort of variations on the traditional text features. And, you know, that teaspoon on each page that shows you the relative size of the of each um, insect to the spoon. Yes. Until, until you get to the last page where there is a pet rock. Yes. <laughs> and, and a collection of rocks, so basically they can be any size. Yeah. At, at the launch, we all got to make pet rocks. Oh, did you oh. launch that? <laughs> so, um, and, you know, there's another book that's it, – um, at first it didn't – I didn't – to tell the truth, I thought, oh, I don't know if I love the uh, images. Like it, they, it just sort of didn't do it for me. Mm. But the, the text and the content won me over, mm. and it's called and, and it's called Come Over to My House, and it's a great book for uh, very easily bringing diversity into children's minds because in Come Over to My House, which is a great has connected book, they go to these children, and there's all these children with different. Um, disabilities, um, a child in a wheelchair, and it explains their disabilities at the end. It shows um, um, children um, who read Braille or a mother who reads Braille, I think, um, and then talks about their way of experiencing everyday life with incorporating their disabilities. And it's just it's just a call, Come Over to My House by Eliza Hull and Sally and Rippin. And the legend, Sally Rippin. Uh, and I, oh, I, yes. I actually really like the illustrations. Of yeah, I don't know. It's Daniel Gray Burnett, he's done another awesome one, um, Katarina Crookshanks, which is just about oh. a non – like it's a – it's a very non-gendered book about a, this um, little kid who just loves being extravagant, but and it uses they them pronouns throughout it as well, which is just nice to have a balance of books use uh, representing it. It's another this this one come over to my house is another one from that imprint Light Bright Books that does amazing work. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. Just tell me that again. Light Bright. Is yeah. Light Bright. Light Bright. Yeah. Yeah. An imprint of Hardy Grant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so again, what's coming through without even really hunting, the books about diversity and First Nations and sustainability come through all the time. Mm. So that's a that's a teacher's friend because yes. we've got because we've got that in our curriculum. Across, you know, there's the book that's already you probably would know already because it won an award, the Dry to Dry about the um, seasons in Kakadu. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. So I just think it, when people get into bookstores. These books are there that address those cross-curricular priorities and, of course, unpack all the content learning areas as well. Um, and I found some of them, you know, not so much get out of date, but the world changes really quickly because there's one here called Commonwealth by Greg Dreis, how yes. you say? Yeah. And it's a book really advocating for the national anthem to change, which has changed. So it's really – and it's slam poetry. So, again, it's a good poetry. And so it would be a really good book to say – well, what has happened since this book was first written because they're talking about the need to change the anthem. Mm. So through slam poetry, and it's done, it's written in verse, so slam poetry. So and that's called Commonwealth. Yes. Set that into two words. Yeah, here's, a, here's a great First Nations author, as yeah. you would know. So, and I mean, there's so many great books. So we'll stop when you want us to stop. Well, we probably have to close the books. We have well, it's been an absolute thrill to have you sitting in your um, courtyard, having relocated from the car park at the back of a very busy, <laughs> active bookshop where all things are still happening in there um, whilst oh, yeah. you've taken the time out to speak um, to... We're getting the eyes from, our, from the events team for the grown-up bookstore because they want to set up for a, <laughs> an event. <laughs> I love this. Thank, thank you so much to both of you for, um, for not only taking the time to do this but for collecting and curating a tremendous range of books for, um, for early readers in particular um, or for young, what do we call it, young learners, but a lot of new release books to inspire young learners. You've been inspiring for us. It's great for us as teachers to have um, input around what we can go looking for, what we can expect to find when we go into bookstores and know the wealth and breadth of what's available to us at the moment. So thank you so much, Lucy and Genevieve. Thanks for all that you do to bring books into the hands and lives of all those wonderful children exploring where the wild things are in Brisbane. And thanks for bringing all of that to all of our listeners for this episode. Love to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us today. We've loved to see so many of you that have subscribed to our episodes from all corners of the world. The Teacher's Toolkit podcast is all about giving you an insider's guide to top teaching ideas, tools, techniques in literacy, teaching and learning. Please subscribe to our weekly newsletter via the website. You'll receive advance notice on blogs, podcasts, events and ways to contact us. Thanks, Lucy and Genevieve, and all the best to you and our listeners. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast. To make sure you don't miss any literacy learning tips and insights, please subscribe to our show on your favourite podcast player. At Q Learning, our literacy specialists draw on over 30 years of teaching and international consulting experience to deliver world-class learning solutions. We equip, empower and support teachers to become their authentic selves. To find out about upcoming webinars and about how Q can help you and your school, visit qlearning.com.au. And you can get even more amazing teaching resources right now at teachific.com.au. Stay tuned.